Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is, is Monica Dutt. I, we're going to do a little introduction for all the people that are in here. We'll maybe give one more minute for people to, to come in. Appreciate you all being here. Um, and to start with, actually, while, while we're waiting for people to come in, I'll give you a, a few logistics. Um, through our initial part of the presentation, we are going to keep people muted. Um, but there is a chat box, which you'll see. And if you wanted to, to use it even just to say where you're from or you know, what part of the country you're in, you're uh, logging in from or a bit about your organization, feel free to do that just to try that out. But we'll, we'll keep the chat box up and we'll, we'll take questions if, if it seems like there's a good place to do it along the way. Otherwise, we'll, we'll save them for the end. Um, we will... Un, we're not able to unmute people at the end for questions if you're calling in by phone. So if you are only using phone to, to get the audio, please make sure to use the chat box because we don't want to miss your, your questions. But if you are logging in on the computer, you can just let us know and then unmute, and unmute you at the end to get your question. Um, we are also going to be screen sharing quite a bit through this presentation so we'll have um sharing from different people as we're, we're going through to show you feel free if you'd like to also pull up the the tool on your own screen if you have enough space there and you could even play along as you as you go as we're going along because the the thing with this tool is it's really helpful to to use it yourself and to, to do the steps, but feel free to just also follow us and get a sense of the tool before you jump in and, and use it yourself. Um, oh, I'm looking at all the people giving their places. So we do have quite a, quite a selection so far, Ottawa, Grand Prairie, Alberta, Calgary. I saw a Nova Scotia up there somewhere. I think I know a few of you. Um, Halifax, this is exciting. So, so welcome to everyone. We did have a few hundred people sign up, so we're probably gonna have a, a pretty big group. So stepping back, I'm gonna start us off officially with the, the rest of our, our webinar. As I said, my name's Monica Dutt. I'm executive director of a nonprofit, which you probably have heard of. It's called Upstream. And Upstream is a, a national nonprofit and our vision is that we can achieve health and well-being through a focus on social justice and equity. And we do that through collective mobilization in a, in a number of different ways. We, we host events across the country, including a, a conference and local events. We have a, a story shop, which um, puts out a range of different um, products and stories and, and blogs and podcasts. So of course, feel free to check those out. And then we have a think tank component, which involves policy, advocacy, research, and all of our work focuses on how to make kind of research and evidence and information more understandable and usable, especially for, for all of us working in kind of advocacy, nonprofit, public health, um, a range of sectors but to, to make that usable to be able to support our our work that we're doing and that's how this partnership with the public health agency of canada uh, fits really well with that and that's why we're we're part of this webinar i'm going to ask my colleague alex who will also be speaking a fair amount in the webinar to to introduce himself now everybody um, my name's alex patterson and i'm the policy and research coordinator uh, with Upstream and um, I'm here to really help you um, kind of use the data to assess the policy, policy and research impact that you might have. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Okay, and I'll ask Colin Steensma from Public Health Agency of Canada to also introduce himself. Thanks, Monica. Hi, um, so I'm Colin Steensma and I'm the uh, technical lead with the Health Inequalities Reporting Team uh, at Public Health Agency of Canada with the Social Determinants of Health Division. So uh, I'm really happy to be here with, with all of you today and uh, just here to answer any questions you might have about the data tool and the initiative in general and uh, very much looking forward to it. 
And also say what we have a few people who are kind of on the line. One of the coordinators of everything you're seeing is Jared Noel, who does communications in our, our story shop for Upstream. And then there are a few other people from Public Health Agency of Canada, as well as Upstream, also on the line. So first slide I'm just going to go through is our, our objectives. So these are the, the objectives that we're going to go through over the next hour, although there'll be quite a bit of time for, for discussion. So the goals are by the end of this webinar that you'll be able to navigate the health inequalities data tool to find information the tool has to offer, that you'll understand the range of indicators and stratifiers available and how to get to the information you need, that you'll understand the meaning of summary measures of inequalities and how to move through the different drop down menus that are available through the tool. And, you know, almost most importantly out of all of that is to be able to use all of this through practical examples that will give you um, that are useful for civil society organizations to be able to, to inform the work that you're doing in terms of policy work, research, advocacy. And so hopefully by the end of the, the session, you'll have been able to, to do all of those things. So I am going to turn it back to Colin now, who's going to talk a little bit about the, the origin of the tool itself. Thanks, Monica. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of uh, background, uh, not only on the data tool, but also on the uh, initiative. So the Pan-Canadian uh, Health Inequalities Reporting Initiative was created in order to respond to certain domestic and international uh, commitments we have to uh, related to health equity. So as you know, in 2012, Canada endorsed the World Health Organization's uh, Rio Political Declaration on the Social Determinants of Health. And one of the things the Rio Declaration called for was to improve monitoring systems to track health inequalities. And this includes also a routine provision of data which is disaggregated by socioeconomic factors. And we'll explain later on in the demonstration what we mean by that. The, initi the initiative also supports the Government of Canada's commitments to respond to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls for actions. And this includes um, monitoring, measuring, and reporting on gaps in uh, health outcomes and social determinants of health that exist between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. The development of the Health Inequalities Data Tool was made possible through collaboration between Public Health Agency of Canada, the Pan-Canadian Public Health Network, Statistics Canada, and the Canadian Institute for Health Information. And the, the data tool is really the first product of the initiative. It was launched last year. We're also very excited to be announcing the upcoming release of the Key Health Inequalities in Canada report. So this report is um, a national portrait which draws from the results in the data tool but focuses specifically on 22 uh, key health indicators which were um, chosen working with our federal, provincial, territorial partners for their importance to health equity in Canada. <clears throat> uh, the report, it should also be mentioned that the report uh, includes some data and context on First Nation peoples living on reserve and in Northern communities. And this was provided through uh, collaboration with the First Nation Information Governance Center. So Upstream will be uh, sending you out the, the link to the report once it goes live. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Alex to begin the demonstration. Thank you. So we're gonna start with a live walkthrough of the tool. Um, you can get to the tool using a simple Google search. Um, the most complex keywords you could use are FAC health inequalities data tool. It often comes up if you just do health inequalities data tool. Um, when you click on the link, you're going to get to a home. Oh, so you can either end up there or you can end up on um, kind of the landing page uh, that gives you some health indicators uh, mapping and you press the big green button to get to the health inequalities data tool. Um, so we're gonna start with how you navigate the tool. And to start with, you need to choose what geography you're looking at. There's two geographic tabs. One is for geographic comparison of the provinces. And then the other is for looking at single areas. When you decide, when you decide on the scope, 
you need to um, know that for the geographic comparisons, um, there's only really numerators and crude rates available. But um, when you want to look at the actual inequalities and figure out gaps between different jurisdictions, you have to choose the national, provincial, and territorial data tab. Um, if you're choosing that tab, you have a geographic choice between studying a single province or territory or looking at a national comparison. Um, after you choose that drop down menu, um, you have to choose your way through the next set of drop down menus, descending to the bottom. Um, each drop down menu above changes the options in the menu below it, so don't skip drop down menus. Um, that'll lag your time and you might not get the options um, when you choose a specific domain. So next choose the framework component, otherwise known uh, as domains, and you want to examine uh, which domain you're choosing. So you can see there's a set of domains under which indicators are listed. For example, the two main domains are health status and health determinants. Under those two main domains, you'll see several uh, indicators which are placed based on the indicator's nature. To orient yourself on where to find the indicator you need, we recommend you take a look at the more information, that big blue box there on the left side, or you can look at the PDF called Map of Available Indicators that you could download from that homepage that we started at. There are over 70 indicators and as many as 14 stratifiers. Each indicator could be stratified by different stratifiers. Stratifiers vary depending on the data source where the indicator comes from. And something to note is that all graphs can be uh, stratified by binary gender. Um, these these data sets are available by clicking the buttons at the bottom of each graph. And all results have three options. You can see you can look at just data for males, just data for females, or um, you can use the blue bar, which is a combination of both. Uh, there are basic and summary measures to choose from when going through each set of data. Basic measures include numerator, crude rate, and age standardized rate. These summary measures are the measures of inequality, which will be explained a bit later. The number of measures available depends on the indicator that you chose. Another important thing to take note of is the relationship between graphs and summary tables. So you have the graph up above, but then you have summary tables, tables below it. Um, you can use the summary tables to establish confidence by using that second column there, 95% CI. That means those are the ranges where we have 95% confidence. Um, reference groups in most cases line up with groups considered to have the most social privilege. So when you're using the graph or the table, you're um, looking at the relationship between your target group and the reference group. Now we'll go back to Monica to talk about data sets. So to get a sense of where all the data came from, you can tell that it, it comes from a number of different data sets. So this is a, a very comprehensive resource in terms of data coming from multiple sources that has been put together to give you the information that you will get through this tool. Uh, the one thing to note is that for First Nations people, some of the, the data for some of the indicators, it may be off reserve only. So you do need to check whether it is both off reserve and on reserve. There is a new report that will have more First Nations on reserve data collected through the First Nations Regional Health Survey, and as well the upcoming uh, Public Health Agency of Canada report that was mentioned will also be utilizing some of that information and will have more, more comprehensive data. So the table shows the range of uh, health and health determinant domains for which indicators are available. It is important to note that the different indicators have different stratifiers because the data source is different. Some are constant while others change dependent on the data source and whether the indicator is for adults or we're looking at something for children and youth. For instance, when looking at social protection, income quintiles and cultural background is not available. When looking at youth data, age standardized rate is not available because you're looking at a specific age cohort. You can check out the full map of in indicators on the tools homepage. So really stratifies are a way that we can separate data into subgroups. And I, I will say throughout this, this presentation and discussion, there, there are a lot of different terms 
a great thing about the tool is that it does give you definitions when you're going through. So if some, I know we have a range of kind of knowledge and background who are attending. So some may be very familiar with all of the terms. Some of you may not be. So just to give that background too, that you can um, look up the, the different terms if you need to. So stratifiers are the different social and demographic variables meaningful to health equity which could be targeted for policy proposals that affect equity equity initiatives so you would look at the stratifiers that are are most relevant to the work that you're doing there are five different ways to measure the magnitude of health inequalities with the tool to understand the measures available on the tool let's look at an example of core housing need across the country uh, so you can see on the screen the definition of core housing need that we're using uh, it's provided by StatsCan. Um, so the first thing to notice um, about the way that you can uh, navigate the tool um, is that you'll notice this big green button right under the tool and that's um, your download the graph button. So any graph that you produce through navigating the tool, you're going to be able to download into a picture file and slip it in wherever you, you need to use it. Um, when we're, we're looking at this, we're going to go through uh, a number of, of different terms as we're, we're going through each of this. So this is the place where it, it does kind of go through a number of different um, terms that you may or may not be familiar with. And again, you know, if you can ask questions at the end or go back and, and we can talk about them again. So starting with numerator, so what this is looking at is a number of people from each group who is in core housing need. So what you can see from this graph is that there are over 4 million people in the first income quintile that have core housing need, whereas there are under 600,000 people in the highest income quintile group. So, you know, you might think, okay, clearly there's a difference here, but the difficulty with this is it's a, it's a number. We don't know the, the total number of people in each group, which is really important to know. So that's when we move to something like the crude rate. And looking at the, the crude rate, that gives us a rate within a given group. So it does help us a little bit more to get a better idea of how the percentage of core housing needs within each group. However, again, a difficulty with this is that we don't know the age breakdown within each of these groups. So what we do next is go to age standardized rate. So this is a much better and accurate way to make a comparison between groups and it is the measure that you should use and you, you must use for measuring inequalities between groups. And if you're not so familiar with age standardized rate, what it does is make the assumption that every group has a similar age distribution so that it makes it much more accurate and better to be able to, to compare between the, the different groups. However, crude rate, we do still use for infant mortality, indicators for early childhood development, and indicators for youth from age 12 to 17, because they are specific age groups. So when you look at this graph, you can see that in quartile one, 75% of people experience a core housing need. And another aspect of these tools that of this tool that's that's very useful is that you can see that the download graph button that's there so you can always click on that to download a graph that that you want to to keep and to save so next we're going to look at the rate ratio and the rate ratio shows how many times higher or lower the rate of an outcome is in a population group of interest compared to the reference group so you, in the case of housing need, we see that people in the lowest income quintile, which is quintile one, have a seven times higher rate of core housing need than in the reference group, which is the, the highest income quintile. Um, moving on to rate difference. So this is the absolute difference in rates between the population group of interest, which we're using as the lowest income quintile and the reference group. So this shows that people in the lowest income quintile have 64 more people in core housing need per 100 people than those from the group in the highest incomes. 
Um, we're going to go through a few more definitions, so, so bear with me. Next, we're going to attributable fraction. And this is where it starts to get into pieces that, that you may be using to really boost your, your, um, your campaigns and your policy advocacy that you're doing. So looking at attributable fraction, so this counts the potential reduction expressed as a percentage that could be achieved in the population group of interest if they experienced the same rate as the reference group. So it tells us how much of a decline in inequality could potentially be experienced by a change in policy. So then we can delve in this a little more and look at some of the underpinnings of core housing needs by changing the stratifiers and looking for inequities there. So if we change the stratifier to visible minority status and then change the measure to age standardized rate. So instead of our, our previous focus on income, we can now look at how racialization might impact core housing need. So what we see is that visible minorities have a 50% rate of core housing need while non-visible minorities experience a 28% core housing need. So then if we're looking at the, the rate difference, uh, what that'll mean is that 22 more visible minorities experience core housing need per 100 than people who are not visible minorities. You can use all this information to kind of start deciding on the campaigns and assess the policy impact of addressing different health, health outcomes or target, targeting specific groups for equity initiatives. So the next um, three measures that we're gonna go into are PAR, PATH, and PIN. They help you as a campaigner or a researcher assess the maximum potential impact on health outcomes within an entire population in the hypothetical and ideal situation where the less advantaged group experience the same rate of an same rate of the thing that you're studying as the reference group, otherwise known as the most socially advantaged group. You can decide on your policy targets by analyzing the potential health impact. They also provide you with important measures for discussion with policymakers. So we're going to look first at, I know there were a few acronyms in there. So the first one, PAF, P-A-F, which is Population Attributable Fraction. So it's also known as Potential Rate Reduction. And that helps us to understand the percentage of rate reduction that could be achieved in the total population in this hypothetical ideal situation where in which a targeted population group experienced the same rate of the reference group. So for example, looking here, if the prevalence of core housing need among visible minorities was equal to that of people who are not visible minorities, 12% of all cases with core housing need in the total population could be reduced. So this is something that, that you could use when you are, are advocating for a particular intervention that may, may target a, a particular um, demographic. And also just to say visible minority, it is the, the language that's used through the, the Stats Canada um, through the, the, the help in the tool as well as through its publications. I know that people might use different, to, different terms in the work that they do, but for this, we're using the, the terms that are used there. Another really important um, measurement you can use from here is the population attributable rate. So that was the PAR. So that lets us understand the absolute rate reduction in the total population that could be achieved if the population group of interest experienced the same rate as the reference group. So looking here, we could say that the total prevalence of core housing need amongst visible minorities could have been reduced by four per 100 persons if, visible, if people of visible minorities experienced the same prevalence as people who are not visible minorities. And then I'll let Alex, um, Describe the last measure. So the last measure we're going to look at is the population impact number. So what this number describes is the number of cases that would have been reduced or avoided in the to total population in the hypothetical situation in which the population group of interest experienced the same rate as the reference group. This measure is where you can gauge numerically the overall potential impact of a program or policy that you might be proposing to government or studying 
um, setting its effects in society at large if it's already underway. Uh, this policy, uh, policies targeting visible minorities around core housing need could potentially impact up to 1.1 million people. Um, and then the other thing that you can look at is you can compare those numbers to a potential other intervention. So if we look at what a policy uh, intervention targeting um, the lowest income quintile would do, we can see that instead of 1.1 million people, a focus on the lowest income quintile could impact up to 3.4 million people. So it's those types of a comparisons that you're able to do um, when, when you're thinking about what intervention you might propose. Um, and you can do the, also the same type of analysis at the provincial and territorial level if you had started off by choosing um, a province or territory under the geography tab while you're relaying this example out. Okay, so we've walked you through the, the basic navigation and the options available. So what we wanted to do now is go through a few different examples. And we put together a few hypothetical questions that may be ones that maybe similar to the type of, of uh, questions you might ask in your organizations. And then after those examples, we'll have an opportunity for, for more of a, a question and answer time. So the first question that we are putting forward is around food security, food insecurity, and racial health inequality. So the question is, if you were designing a program to address urban food insecurity from a racial equity lens, which two racialized groups experience similar levels of food insecurity and therefore would make sense to target? So you can see that we're kind of walking through the, the different steps in, in the analysis. So we chose Canada, chose the framework component, social inequities, chose the indicator, food insecurity, moderate to severe, the stratifier is cultural and racial background, and then because we're comparing between groups, we always want to use the, the age standardized rate. So when we look at the data for Canada, we can see both people that identify as black as well as off reserve indigenous peoples have similar levels of food insecurity. So we, we asked this question and also wanted to go through it because it does give some information that potentially you may or may not have expected. So it's, it's an, an example of how data that you've, you're using from this tool could potentially either strengthen your case or kind of change the direction that you take. So um, this is one example of, uh, of the way we could use this tool. And after that example, I'm going to pull up an, a different one that Alex is now going to take you through. So some data can act as a really good entry point for further qualitative study because you don't necessarily get all the answers to the questions you might have just by looking at the data. But for example, when we look at mental health equity, we see significant inequalities worth exploring. For instance, we can see from the data, there is actually a massive inequity related to indigenous mental health. When we review the number of mental health hospitalizations for people from areas with predominantly Indigenous identity, we can notice significant gaps. Um, so we've removed the both sexes bar um, to look at this example. And when we do that, we can see in particular First Nations men are bearing a heavy burden. The difference between First Nations men and women is higher than the total rate difference um, that's experienced between First Nation people and the low concentration reference group. Um, so we can switch to the income quintile stratifier. And when we do that, we can see that there is something unique to the First Nations experience of mental health hospitalizations. If we recall the previous example with Indigenous identity, that those living in a predominantly First Nations area have an even greater rate of mental health illness than what we see of those living in low-income areas, 
we can see that the rate of mental health hospitalizations for First Nations identity is markedly higher than this low income quintile. This suggests there could be, and I would say most likely is, strong evidence base for being sick with the harms of colonialism, which is in addition to the influence of poverty on mental health. So there's um, areas of study there for further study there to see what the link between poverty, colonialism, and mental health is. Now we're going to go back to Monica for our last pre-selected uh, data example. Okay, right, so in this one, um, we, we at Upstream, we campaign often for policy interventions that address poverty as a determinant of health. So we always try to stay on top of the data behind which groups are experiencing poverty. So for this example, we wanted to look at child poverty with the tool and break down the data a little bit more using immigrant status and racial background together. So we can see from the data that recent immigrants who are racialized experience the highest rates of child poverty, with recent black immigrants having a 40% prevalence of poverty in low-income households compared to only 25% for white recent immigrants. Looking at long-term immigrants, so long-term immigrant households end up having the lowest child poverty prevalence, while black poverty still remains the highest of all long-term immigrant groups, followed closely by Arab Southwest Asian people. Looking at non-immigrant groups, off-reserve First Nations Inuit have the highest health highest child poverty prevalence trail very closely by black children. 34% of off-reserve First Nations and 30.9% for black Canadians. So there's, there's a lot in all of this that you could analyze in different ways. The data suggests that there is a long-term structural and racialized poverty that is independent of the experience of immigration. Looking specifically at, at one province and we'll take Nova Scotia where, where I am, there is, you'll see there that there is 49.7% forty nine prevalence of non-immigrant black child poverty and a 39% prevalence among off-reserve First Nations Inuit Métis children. So the data does seem to suggest pockets of long-term inequality for indigenous peoples and black Canadians. So those are the examples that we had for you. Um, we wanted to open it up for any clarifying questions about the tool and how to use it, um, or any questions around how you might be able to, to work through a specific problem. Um, I haven't followed all the chat. I think it's mainly people who are introducing themselves. So I don't see that there's any questions in there right now. So I'll ask if you have there a is, There's one in the Q&A um, box. Okay. And the first one is, what is the recommended citation for downloading graphs? I feel like that's a call-in question. Can you answer that, Colin? Sure, no problem. So Alex, if you go onto the, um, the homepage, the landing page for the tool, Yep, I will just let me get it back up and uh, screen shared, sorry. So there's a lot of information on that page, um, you know, that we've already been alluding to in terms of if you want to go back and understand better the indicators, some of the measures that are being used. Um, yeah, so if you go to the health inequalities, there we go. And uh, as Alex is mentioning, we see the map of the indicators there. Um, you can also get more specific information about each indicator when you look down a bit further past the more information uh, section. And uh, if you keep going down there, Alex, um, just to mention, again, there's that link out to uh, a document that gives some very nice examples of the measures that we use. Um, also a lot of the information about what the stratifiers are, the data sources. And as Alex has uh, highlighted there, we, we have the uh, suggested citation that you can use.
Nora Liu actually wrote in the chat box, so to speed this up, I'll, I'll just read, read for her. Uh, have you tried or do you plan to get Canada Revenue Agency data? That would be the most helpful for identifying low-income individuals in areas and information on the percent of low-income peoples who are not filing taxes and hence not accessing benefits is important. Colin, you, I feel like you should stay off mute. You can, I think this is your question too. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we're definitely, you know, the, the data tool is not uh, by any means something that we, we see as a, as a static thing. We, we definitely want to keep updating, uh, adding indicators, uh, particularly those types of indicators that are more uh, speaking to uh, determinants. Uh, we, we have quite a few health determinants already in our indicators, and uh, but we really want to put more focus on that. Um, specifically to your question about revenue data, we are exploring um, a fair number of options with uh, our partners at Statistics Canada, and that, that would be one of them. We, we're looking in particular at, um, there's a lot more uh, what we call linked data sets now, so we can take that revenue information and link it up to um, like census data and, and try to get some some better, uh, more fuller indicators uh, for, for things such as, as what you're mentioning. So we're definitely exploring those options, yes. Um, there was another question about whether it's possible to set your own group for comparison. Um, and the answer to that is the reference groups are specified by the data sets already. It's not a, um, it's not like you can click a box and put a new group as the reference group. It's, um, I would say 90% of the, the indicators have the most socially privileged group as the reference group. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's correct. Alex. It's, it's really the, the idea is to try to go with the group that we assume to be the most uh, privileged in that situation. And that's, that's, that's how the reference groups were chosen. Um, I see a, a question here. Um, is there a plan to have data available for small, smaller geographies? And there was a question I also saw earlier about whether there would be regional availability. And I know currently that it only, the smallest level is provincial, but what's the plan going forward? I would say. So uh, smaller jurisdictions. So I, I, if if we're referring to um, like at the at the regional health authority level, um, the it's it's a bit complicated for us to have that kind of data at that level. Um, you might notice also with even the data that we have already. What we've had to do is uh, combine, let's say we're working with uh, some sort of survey such as a Canadian Community Health Survey. We've had to combine uh, a bunch of different years data to get uh, to the point where we're going to have results that will give us some interesting, uh, or to get, to get data that will give us some interesting results on, you know, all those different uh, stratifiers that we want to look at. And on top of that, also by sex, gender, and also by province. So to also then go down to the regional level, unfortunately, is, is not something that uh, we think is going to be feasible. I mean, we never say never. We're, we'll continue to explore those possibilities. Um, in terms of smaller jurisdictions, though, uh, at the provincial level, we are also exploring options because there, it does happen sometimes that we have the way that our, our stratifiers are set up that we, we sometimes don't have uh, meaningful information for some of the smaller uh, provinces and territories. So we are looking at ways of how we can improve on that. And um, I would guess also that, uh, what, what was the other part of the question? <laughs> I, I think that kind uh, you, of- you, covered You've it. covered it. Um, yeah, okay. So I'm going to knock off two here. We've got uh, Stefka asks, where is the age of each data set specified? Um, so the age of a data set is specified often in the indicator. Um, so I'm just going to do a screen share again to 
to show this. Um, you can see here when I click under um, indicator sense of community belonging, there's a youth age set, which is here 12 to 17, and then there's an adult age set at 18 plus, and this is also an answer to the next question from about whether or not there's indicators on social uh, isolation. So we have a sense of community belonging as the two that are in the data tool here. Um, so the other thing that you can do when you're doing an age standardized rate is you can click between uh, 10 year age groups or five year age groups, um, which, may, which can change the uh, age standardized rate a little bit dependent on the data. Um, remembering that unfortunately you're not able to immediately get the age breakdown of a particular group um, because they're all being age standardized to make it, you know, as a lay person, I have a hard time explaining age standardized rate, but it's essentially what you're doing is making it so that the ages the age cohorts available in the data are all made the same because some groups such as First Nations in our country have way more youth than um, white Canadians do. So to have a legit comparison between them, we need to like mash up those, those age groups to be comparable. Yeah. Nope. Maybe just to add to that, Alex, too. So, so those, those two choices that you see there, the 10 year uh, age groups and the five year, um, just to say that the, the five year is, you know, that, that's what we would like to have. We'd like to have smaller age groups if possible because it will kind of give us a more fine grained um, uh, distribution of the, the age groups in the population. Uh, the 10 year though, we had to use for uh, the provincial level comparisons. And uh, so, so that's why you have those different options. We just added that recently. The other advantage with the five year is when the, our uh, key health inequalities in Canada report comes out. This is a so this is a national level report. We're reporting really at the Canada wide level results, and those results use the five year age group. So if, if you want to really get those same results that you're going to see in the report, then that's really the uh, the option to take is the five year. Um, we have another question about how frequently are we going to see updates in the data. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we would like to do uh, something like every five years. Uh, that's that's an ideal we're aiming for. Um, so that you know that that's kind of what we're aiming for is every as every five years. Just to to have an appreciation though of the fact that. Um, First of all, it's it's very complex process to put all this information together. Um, the other important thing to remember, though, is that um, people who might be used to seeing, you know, more traditional kind of surveillance data, uh, where it's really, you know, we we really do want to update things as quickly as possible, and then and for very good reasons. Um, just to keep in mind here that our our goal is not really to document or to do surveillance on a particular health condition, but more the inequalities that exist for that condition that, that you know, be it a health outcome or a determinant of health. And those uh, inequalities, they're, they're not, they're not going to change as quickly as say like the prevalence of, uh, of obesity or something like that. So just to keep that in mind as well. Um, we're still taking new questions if you want to put them in the Q&A box. Because the, the data is available for download, can we change the reference group? So I think that's saying more if you can access the raw data yourself, can you change the, the reference group if I'm understanding correctly? Because you, you wouldn't be able to change it through the, the tool, but maybe Colin can speak to it if there's aspects of this that can be downloaded. The data itself can be downloaded in order to, to with themselves and assuming that's a whole other process yeah we are we are actually uh, planning to put I'm not going to call it the raw data uh, we, we do have our um, aggregated data that we're planning to put on the open.data.canada I believe that's what it's called open.data.canada site and uh, that that 
uh, sorry, I should I should specify that's related to uh, a report. So we we are going to share that data. The, the the data for the the tool, as you saw, are available in the tables um, below uh, the graphs. But no, unfortunately, we can't really uh, modify those those categories. Um, it really has to be done. Uh, that's something that we you know we need to do with our data providers, Statistics Canada. And, and I'm, those just, partners. I'm just going to show everyone. So when you go below the summary tables, you've got this little um, download detailed table function where you can get uh, the data that you see in the summary tables rather than it's a different function than the uh, big green button, which downloads a PNG file of the, of the graph, but you, you can get those, those summary tables right there. Okay. I, I'm seeing that there are no other questions out there. I think everyone who's had their hand up has been attended to. So um, I won't keep you longer than we need to. I was just making one last check that we haven't missed anybody. But um, I wanted to, to thank you all for, for being part of this webinar. And thank you to, to Alex and Jared and Colin for all of your work on this. We will be sending out a um, um, evaluation that we ask that, that you fill in and that will really help us for, for future webinars as well as to, to inform this tool. And I think your, your questions have been really helpful already just in terms of looking at how to make a tool like this most useful for, I think, a broad range of audiences from people who have a lot of experience using this type of tool and data and people who may have less experience but really want to make sure that their, their advocacy and policy and research is, is evidence-based. So um, thanks again for spending probably for a lot of you your lunch times or an hour of your time with us and hopefully this will be the first of a, a series of webinars coming from upstream. So I, I hope that you'll uh, join us for, for future sessions and, and thank you for, for joining from across the country today.